it thinks we're already in that lane, so it did not do a good job of it. So we'll take it out of autopilot. <laughs> so once again, not exactly a perfect solution. Yeah. Everybody, I'm Franny and look what I've got here today. So one of my awesome neighbors let me borrow his Model 3 for the day and it's not just any Model 3, this is the Model 3 Performance. So this is the top of the line of the Model 3's from Tesla and it's an amazing, amazing car. Super fast, very efficient, great range, super usable, just a really amazing car all around. What I want to do is kind of talk to you a little bit about this car from an internal combustion owner's kind of perspective. So we have kind of a crazy garage here for the channel and we have six cars. All of them except for one of them is just a completely internal combustion engine car. Uh, we do have an i8 which is a hybrid so it's half electric and half gas. So we do have a little introduction to the electric driving and sort of electric vibe but this car here is very different. So what I want to do is kind of run you through some of the features and kind of the interesting things about this car in particular. And then I want to kind of talk a little bit about electric cars in general and how they fit into the kind of nationwide and worldwide fleet of cars available. Tesla's Model 3 comes in a few different flavors. It comes in a single motor version. That's their cheapest and more entry level car. And then they have a dual motor that has an extended range. And then this car is the performance version of the dual motor if that makes any sense so there's three of them and if you want auto uh, autopilot then that's a little bit of an extra that's kind of expensive too it's like seven grand or something like that there aren't a lot of options on the car and there aren't a lot of ways to configure the car and that's important we'll get back to that a little later but the colors on this car are pretty basic red white blue silver and black pretty much and that's about it the interiors can come in white or black or sort of a mixture of white and black so pretty basic kind of stuff like that and i think tesla is just trying to get these cars out the door there's a huge huge want for these cars right now and tesla has been trying to build these things as fast as possible and that is causing some problems for their manufacturing things like door gaps and fit and there's some blurbles and paint and so the fit and finish on the cars isn't exactly perfect but you know what Tesla is a brand new company well, not exactly brand new but they certainly are a new car company and we'll give them a little bit of slack for that because it's really difficult to tool up a huge factory and produce 200,000 cars a year or something crazy like that that's really really hard to do this car has a pretty big battery on it it hits 75 kilowatt hours and it has about a really good efficiency about 290 watt hours per mile it gives this thing a range north of 300 miles 320 something like that but for the performance model it's all about how fast this thing can get up and go and it has a 0 to 60 of 3.2 seconds and it's even been tested faster than that it's that's just absolutely crazy and of course the performance on an electric car is not affected by altitude at all so you can be up at the top of a mountain and this thing will be just as fast with one exception and that is going to be the temperature so the range on the cars for electric cars in general are affected pretty significantly by temperature. The colder it gets, the less range they have. Just something to kind of keep in mind. And let's talk a little bit about maintenance on these cars. I keep hearing that these cars are zero maintenance and that isn't exactly true. These cars are basically a regular car. As James May said, what else can I tell you? It's just basically a car. And he's right about that. The only real difference, of course, is the electric motors and the battery. But other than that, it's got the same sort of basic brakes that any other car does doors, door latches, lights, all headlights, taillights, all that sort of stuff is basically the same. So you've got maintenance and repairs on some of these things when they break. But as far as changing engine oil and having to go to the dealer for annual service, well, it's, it's, it does exist, but it's just different. We're not servicing that big engine that we had in our car. What we're servicing are, say, the brakes. And interestingly, this is very interesting, because these cars have regenerative braking, 
that puts a lot of drag on the car so you don't use the brakes as much. And you think, oh, that's awesome. Then I don't have to maintain my brakes. But you actually do, and brakes are funny. They really get kind of weird if you don't use them. They actually work much better if you do. It's kind of a known issue on these cars that one of the brake pads can lock up or both of them and you start losing your brakes up front or in the back, I suppose. And that's really bad because then when you really do need the brakes for an emergency stop, you've got one pad that's locked up. So what you really need to do with these cars is on a yearly basis, pull the wheels off, pull the pads out of the calipers, re-lube them and put them back in and just make sure that your brakes are working 100%. Remember that you've also got just brake fluid service is going to happen every other year just like it would in any other car. The brake systems on these cars are just pretty much exactly the same as any other internal combustion engine car. Now in addition to the brakes and stuff you've got tires and you've got alignments you have to take care of. You've got suspension components on the car. There's all sorts of things that really need to be looked at on an annual or biannual basis. So these aren't maintenance free. That's not that's not really a thing. But they do have lower maintenance certainly because because we don't have to deal with the engine or also the transmission. These cars don't have a transmission. So you don't have to deal with changing out fluids and having problems with clutches and all that sort of stuff. So that's super awesome. Let's talk a little bit about charging these cars. Now the charge port on this car is right here. We just push on the back here and and that cold comes open. Okay, so this is where you would plug in your charger to charge the car. Now, here's one of the big issues, I think, with these cars that makes them very different than an internal combustion engine. So with an IC car, we're used to filling out and about, right? We go to work, we fill on the way home, we can top off our car when we're out shopping or whatever we're doing, we can always fill out and about. Now these cars, it's a little bit different, it's a lot different actually. In the Denver metro area, and this is including Boulder, so we're talking close to 4 million people, there are only three Tesla superchargers. You're like, wow, really? Well, yeah, the supercharger network, at least in this part of the country, in the center part of the country, is really more for long distance driving. So you'll see them dotted along the interstates where people can go from charger to charger and charge up their car. And that works great for long trips. But around town, it's not really practical. And the closest one here is like, almost 17 miles away so you'd have to drive all the way out there charge up your car and then you'd lose all that coming back so that's not really very practical so what do you do about that how does that work well there's other small chargers around as well they call them destination chargers at like uh, restaurants and hotels and things but you really have to be a patron there in order to really use those they have a little charger at Walgreens these are going to be fairly low power chargers and take a long time they're not going to put much in your car so my point is you can't really use that to fill up your car. You can kind of use it to sort of top off a little bit while you're out and about and that's about it. But to get a really full charge, you're probably gonna have to do that at home. Well, that actually sounds pretty cool. Well, it is, it's a paradigm shift. We're so used to filling out and about, now we're gonna fill up <laughs> now we're going to fill up our car at home. Well, you can't fill up your, your ICE car at home, can you? You don't have gas tanks at home. That's actually pretty cool and makes it pretty easy. So what you need in your house, well, what about like if I just plugged it into a 110 outlet? Well, that's like 20 amps at the most, and that's going to take a long time to charge up your car. It's pretty slow. It's going to take um, probably a couple of days to fill up one of these cars from, from you know completely empty. So that's not super good. Well, what about if I got a 220 outlet like I have for my dryer or something like that? Well, now we're talking. So you're doubling the voltage and you can kick the current up to 50, 60 amps, something like that. And that's what a home Tesla charger would be for your car. They're kind of expensive. You need to have an electrician come out and plumb in electric into your garage, 220 outlet in the right spot and everything. And this is the most important bit, kind of need a garage. And that's kind of the impo most important part of all of this, which is great if you've got a house and you've got an open bay in your garage and you've got room, that's awesome. But what about if you live in an apartment? What about in a city center or something like that? Uh, condos. Now, some of these apartment complexes and condos are now putting up electric chargers outside where you can plug in, but you can't be there forever. Even the Tesla chargers, if they get full, you need to get your car off the charger and get out of there or they'll start to charge you. And you're gonna, I think that that's gonna be a thing. You're gonna run into some etiquette 
etiquette issues between um, on how these cars are charged out in the wild. So that's, I think that's going to be an issue coming up in the next few years because we've got a lot of electric cars coming out, right? We've got Pulsar, we've got the Audi e-tron, Porsche Taycan. I mean, there's so many cars. Volkswagen's making tons of electric cars, but you're going to see a lot more of these. And what about people who live in neighborhoods that maybe only have a one car garage and it's kind of filled with a bunch of junk. Do you really want to fill, uh, fill these things or charge them outside? Do you want to do that? I don't know, I guess you could, but it's not really a car that you would leave outside. So kind of, I think these things really work best if you have a garage. I don't know, it's something to think about with an electric car. Something else I'd like to talk about with electric cars is why are they so expensive? They seem to be about half again as expensive as a, another ICE car in this basic configuration. And it's kind of interesting because the engine is a very difficult piece to build. It's complicated, so is a transmission. So also very expensive, and this car doesn't have either of those. So it's got its electric motor, which supposedly just has like a moving part. So yeah, they have to be wound and they're kind of technical, but I don't think they're as expensive to put together as a standard gasoline engine would be. So no transmission. Uh, we do have the battery pack. The batteries are pretty darn expensive, huh? I mean, these battery packs have almost 3,200 different individual cells. But on the rest of it, it's just basically a car. I think that these cars, as they're coming out, we end up paying for a lot of the R&D on them as well. And there is a decent amount of interest in these cars as well. So it's kind of keeping the pricing up a little bit. The Model 3 in this series was really more of an entry-level car. And that's really kind of cool. But there's still, you know, 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand, 60 grand for a performance car like this. Now this right, one delivers with a 0 no, 060 and uh, oh. as well as this car drives, it's 60. pretty much what you'd expect for a 50 to $60,000 <laughs> yes. car, I think. In fact, <laughs> you know, you're not going to get that performance yes. in anything <laughs> shy of probably 200,000 as far as the 0 to 60 time goes. But the interior of the car is pretty Spartan and pretty basic. The materials are, they're not premium materials in any way. They're, they're nice and they're easy to keep clean for the most part, but it's not, doesn't have a real premium feel to it. None of the uh, surfaces are leather anymore. That's more of a choice just to be vegan, I think. And it seems fine. I mean, it, it's like I said, it seems okay. It seems fine, but it's not going to wow you with its uh, opulence in any way. But I think it's interesting. Electric cars, I'm sure they'll come down in price. I sure hope they do. But for now, they are a little more expensive than an internal combustion car. Now people will say, well, oh uh, yeah, but then you have to buy gas and blah, 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 and the electric is so much cheaper to fuel and so much easier you can do it at home. Yeah, those are all trade-offs. Oh, totally. But you're probably going to be out six, seven years before that starts to really pay off. So you'll have to decide whether you want to keep the car that long to really make it a financial thing and really working for you. I think with an electric car, you're really going to buy it because it's an electric car and because it's interesting, because it's got all these cool features that you can't get in an ICE car. I don't think you're really going to be worrying about uh, the cost of gasoline versus the cost of electricity. Now, while we're on the topic of fuel, these cars, everybody says, well, they're zero emission. Well, the car itself maybe, but the fuel, not so much. So these cars, I like to look at these cars as more like a flex fuel car. It's kind of cool. They can run on coal, they can run on solar, they can run on wind, they can run on hydro, and they can even be, get this, this is cool, they can even be nuclear powered. How cool is that? Because these cars run on electricity and whatever flows through the grid is what they're going to take up. And so for Colorado, for us, that is coal. Now we have about a 20K array of solar on our house. So we make a lot of solar energy every day. And so our car, our electric car here at our house would be solar powered, whereas across the street, it would be coal powered. That's good. Kind of an interesting concept, I think. Whereas a gasoline car is pretty much gasoline powered. You've got, you can't put much else in it. But I think that's interesting about these cars. So their emissions are going to be based on where their electricity came from and how far you are away from the, the stations, the substations, how much loss there is in the lines and all the conversions and your charger on the wall and blah, blah, blah. But working through all of it, I think on the whole, these cars actually produce less emissions and less carbon than uh, 
uh, a standard gasoline car. Something else I'd like to talk about with the car is just how quiet these things are. They're super duper quiet inside, and of course the electric motor just makes the slightest hum while it's running. Obviously no exhaust out the back. Now a lot of people from an IC background would say, ah yeah, but I kind of like the sound of the engine, and importantly, I like to hear the engine speeding up and slowing down. It gives me an audible indication that the car is speeding up and slowing down. So that's kind of nice, and I do agree with that, but it's really nice to have it very quiet. Quiet inside the cabin, but also quiet in the neighborhood as well. A loud, rumbly car coming through the neighborhood at weird hours. It's just, it's just annoying. It's one thing if you're out on the track or if you're out on the interstate or whatever, it's, that's another thing, I suppose. But, you know, rumbling through a neighborhood's just really not that cool. It, trust me, your neighbors aren't as into your loud car as you are. I guarantee it. They have uh, built these cars to be very comfortable. So quiet, the interiors are nice and soft. It's very inviting. And you know, because of that, it's a very calming effect. When you're in weird traffic and kind of, cause I have to commute to downtown. And when I have the I-8, I put the I-8 in electric mode downtown. The reason is because one, it's efficient and it's always stop and go crummy traffic, but it's just very calming. You pull up to a, a you know, a bit of traffic and you stop and just sits there and it's just quiet. And and I find that to be a really nice feature of electric driving that probably you wouldn't be used to from driving an ICE car. The more time I spend with this car, the more I start to think that the engineers who designed it kind of took a look at the average pain points of a daily drive in a normal internal combustion engine car and that sort of that whole environment and said, you know, how could we eliminate these with a new car? And that's pretty hard if you've got an internal combustion engine. Most of these things are built into sort of that vibe so there's really not much you can do about it but with a full electric car you can really start attacking things so what about having to go fill up your car with gas a lot of people hate going to the gas station it's kind of stinky it's kind of weird it's outside it's cold and you're just gonna have to put gas in the car and if your car is really not that efficient you do it fairly often it's kind of a pain it might be sort of on your way home but then you're trying to find the best deals blah 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 how would it be if you could just fill up your car in your garage that would be awesome so this car solves that problem that's actually pretty neat. What about congested traffic? Oh, it's such a bummer to drive when, you know, in the stop and go traffic. Downtown is like that for us here. And, uh, you know, California is, is just terrible. And back east is really bad too. Most places have a pretty bad rush hour. What if the car could help you through that a bit? Well, the autopilot on this car is actually pretty good for that sort of thing. It can do lane assist and it does a really good job with adaptive cruise control and all of that. It's really neat and uh, it can really alleviate a lot of the stress of driving in stop and go traffic. It's got cameras all around it. It's, it's aware of the things around it and it will put them up on the screen here as well as you're driving. That's actually pretty cool. Now the full on autopilot is an extra on these cars. So it's something you'd have to get. But my point is that I think that the engineers are really looking to make this your daily drive a lot easier. So here I'm going to put it on and now we'll be on navigate on autopilot. So now it'll switch lanes for us because we're on a highway and take us all the way to the exit where the target is. The owner of the car wanted to take me out to demo the autopilot. Here's a rundown of the test. We're going to be on a fairly major highway and then we're going to move from that highway to another highway just through a standard exchange. And then finally we're going to take an exit off of that highway. Now we'll see how it does. Then on the way back it's just the reverse. We'll be on a major highway through an interchange onto another highway and then finally an exit off of that highway. And that felt very normal and natural, didn't feel weird at all, yeah. which is nice. It wasn't some herky-jerky thing at the last seconds, like, oh, yeah. crap. And that's also fairly new. It used to take a while, so turn on the turn signal and wait maybe five seconds or so before it would switch you over and you'd see a car speeding up behind you mm -hmm. to get in. So yep, yep. that's one of the things where it wouldn't drive like you would drive. You would sure. just like, turn signal on and move okay. over. Um, but now it's doing right. a lot better. It's still not perfect, but it's, it's getting there. This will be its first task. We're going to be exiting a highway, moving on to another highway through a gentle left sweeper exit. This is what the, the car is seeing road-wise, and this is what our map looks like. The cars ahead of us are slowing down. 
that's sort of expected. See if I can get yeah, but a you can lot see of the this cars going. automatically put us at 45 to go around this turn, mm. and then it's speeding it back up because it knows we'll get back on the highway here. Yeah, I can feel it sort of picking up speed there a little bit. And it should take us out of this exit lane and put us on the highway here. All right, changing lanes, there it goes, huh? Now will it, as a preference, will it stay in the right lane or middle lane? Does it have Depends any preference? speed, so mm, um, okay. this is actually unusual because we're going to be exiting in 1.3 miles on Kipling, um, but it's going to try to take us around these slower cars first, so um, we'll see. It'll probably move us back over in that lane quickly because we'll need to exit here soon, Okay. but it will if you're going... If the speed you have set 70 is faster than what those cars are going, it'll move you over into the faster lane and put you around and then bring you back over. Oh, that's interesting. It's smart enough to know that as well. So here's where it's like, I would drive ahead of the semi and get in and we'll see what it does, but it knows it needs to get over and can't quite get over yet. Now, why is the semi, why was the semi red? because it can't move over because of that semi. So gotcha. it's okay. letting me know that it can't get over um, because there's a semi there and it's telling me what's in the way. Gotcha, okay. And then here's our exit on Kipling. Notice that the map is showing the correct path for the exit. Up here, but they started it, so we'll see if it can get us in this exit lane. Yeah, so it's gotta figure it's it out. On past it. It thinks we're already in that lane, so it did not do a good job of it. So we'll take it out of autopilot. <laughs> So once again, not exactly a perfect solution, yeah. and most importantly, you really need to stay stay alert. Alert, yeah, absolutely, because it's your butt on the line with this thing. Tesla is not going to take the ticket if you if something goes wrong while it's on autopilot. For sure. All right, with those two tasks, the car got the first one just fine, but when it came to the actual exit, it missed it. Let's see how it does on the return trip on the way home. Okay, now this is just the reverse, so we're going to be making that return right-hand sweeper from one highway to the next. Let's see how it does. And this is how the autopilot's going to deal with it. So kind of at the last minute there, it kind of moved itself over, but it, but it did it. Yep. Yep. And that was completely normal for what? Okay. It does. And I think how you would drive as well, maybe mm -hmm. you turned your blinker a little bit earlier, but... So would you consider this to be more of an assistant then? Because that's what I'm kind of feeling on this. It's yeah, a, for like sure. Right now, driving it's assistant. Not, uh, yeah. I wouldn't trust it with my life. Right. Yet, um, to take my hands off the wheel and go completely crazy. Um, but it does a it does a really good job. It messes up every now and then. But it kind of feels like you're teaching a teenager how to drive. Yes, very much exactly. Yeah. So, so here it'll slow down and take this exit for us. Yeah, and there's our exit. Whoa! Yeah. So we would have been in trouble there if we would have been paying attention. Wow! So yeah, that was a thing, huh? Yeah. Because it just mi it missed the exit? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't quite sure what to do, and I don't know why. Oh my! So what happened there? It kind of looks like the car was just indecisive. It didn't know exactly what to do. It sort of started into the exit, but then kind of backed off a little bit. It was a little weird, and it's a good thing that Christopher had his hand on the steering wheel and pulled the car to the right. And how about maintenance? That's a bit of a pain point for people. Taking the car down to the dealership for oil changes and just sort of scheduled maintenance on the car. These electric cars have less of that, so that's nice. They're trying to reduce that pain point, and I think it's pretty good. We still have to, of course, like I said, we have to deal with brakes. We have to deal with some of the other sort of standard things, because this is a car after all, tires and alignment and things like that. But we're not stuck with that yearly oil change and a few other things on the car and those transmissions issues as well, clutches and things like that. So yeah, I think that's a big plus as well. The car updates itself. So, you know, when you buy an internal combustion engine, we talked about this, the, the car just kind of goes downhill from there. It never really gets any better unless you spend money on modding it and putting in more power and stuff, but you have to go out and do all that sort of stuff. And it can be very expensive. Whereas with this car, they can update things and give you new features and even more performance and range over the air overnight. And a 
lot of it you don't you don't get charged for. That's pretty sweet. And let's say you bought the car and you didn't get the uh, autopilot. They can just install that in your car for you. You don't uh, over the air. You don't even have to take it in. They can just you can just say, oh, I want that, and um, you'll get it. You have to pay for it, of course. But once you do, boom. That's pretty sweet. How about parking? Now, that's a sore point for a lot of people. Parking a car can be difficult. Um, if you've got a tight garage or whatever, this car can actually pull itself in and out of parking spaces. And they just added that feature called summons, where if you're at like a grocery store or something like that, you can have the car actually come meet you in front of the store from the parking lot. It'll actually work its way out of its spot and come and get you. All right, so we're parked a ways away in an empty lot. Oh, this lot isn't mapped. Then the lot isn't mapped. No, so uh, you can see right there, it's gonna try to go over one of these medians. This is a little confusing, but the dark blue line is actually the car. The red X is us, and the yellow line is the proposed path that it's going to take. So let's see how it does. Hit the button and see what it does. All right. There it is, backing out. That is so strange. And so it's pulling through the lot, even across the other spots. Yeah, so it's gonna to try to go the way that it went. Oh, and it sees turned. the median there now. Whoa! So it's coming over, <laughs> make sure no cars are coming. There is one, oh, he's parking up. Oh, here it comes. Look at this. I do feel like I have to mention that it didn't exactly come to a complete stop before it crossed that road. Very slowly. <laughs> That's crazy. Look at that. All right. Come on, kiddo. Does it think it's done? Yeah. Okay. So we put it where it thinks it's done. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, that's the thing that like I think they could do a little bit better next time is like being able to so awesome. <laughs> to point it uh, which way you need to like end up driving, right? So like yes, yeah, so yeah. Like, back it into me or have it here. You can see it's like just blocking like, right, right. A few parking spots, but if they could um, tell it which way to park, that would be great. That's that's awesome, though. It's just, that, that's amazing. It's like a radio control car. Yeah. Might be kind of handy if it's pouring down rain or something. And it's a brand new feature. So a lot of these things kind of, they sound kind of neat, but they're still sort of in the work. But it's, it's an amazing ability for this car to do. Now, if you look at this dash, do you see this? This is crazy. There's no buttons and switches anywhere, really. There's a couple of little rolly balls on the steering wheel and you have two stalks, but that's about it. The rest of everything is really here on the display. So that's a, that could be a plus or a minus. Uh, I wonder if people think that cars are just getting too complicated and maybe having it all, all sitting in menus and things isn't all that much better. I don't know, but at least it's Tesla's think, thinking is to simplify the design, simplify the cabin, and just with a lot less clutter and a lot less crazy inside the car. And I don't know, that's kind of an interesting, it's, a, it's interesting, I think, going to take some getting used to if you're used to being able to just move your hand down and maybe touch a button here to change the temperature or something like that in the car or run the radio volume up and down something like that but I have heard that these cars um, also have the ability to use voice commands to command things like setting the, the heated seats on the car or maybe changing the temperature or whatever, a few uh, some of the controls on the car. Now that would be awesome. Then you really don't need the buttons because the buttons do take your attention away, but if you could just tell the car to do something, that would be pretty sweet. Now, one thing I think this car really could use and doesn't have is a heads up display because there's zero in front of the driver. and it would be nice to know what the speed limit is and what how fast you're going which is generally displayed up here while you're driving and that's that's great and everything but it's off to the side out of your vision and as James May said you know sometimes I find myself looking over at the display just a hair too long and when you look back up at the road that's a whole new place and so that to me is a little bit scary but it is sort of in your peripheral vision. It's really probably not that much different than having it kind of low and having to look down to see it on a normal car. 
So a heads-up display would have been a better option, I think. Now, how about security on your car? What about if your car gets vandalized or something? That's always, you come back out and there's like a dink in your car or something or a scratch or something. You're like, that wasn't there when I came in. It would be really, really nice to know. And heaven forbid somebody actually vandalizes your car. And that happens. Tesla has you covered there too. It's very, they have the coolest feature that I don't know if any other cars have this, but they all should. And it's called Century Mode. It's this little guy up here and and when you put on sentry mode, around the car, all the cameras are sitting there waiting. And if they detect any motion at all, they'll go ahead and start recording. And that's great. So if somebody comes up and scratches your car on purpose or whatever, you can get a video of them actually doing that. There's a lot of videos on the internet of people doing that with these cars. And I think the reason why you see them is because this car has the ability to record it. Other cars get vandalized all the time as well. They just don't have any way to know that it happened or and so door dinks anything like that somebody gets too close to your car somebody walks by it and scratches it you'll know so that's kind of cool that's a really neat feature i think all cars should have that my final conclusion on this tesla and electric cars in general is that they're super interesting in fact game changers in fact this car, I would say, borders on revolutionary. The amount of tech that they bring, the way they solve so many different problems is really amazing. And honestly, I just can't see the internal combustion engine, you know, kicking away forever. But this car, because of its flexibility, its ability to run on so many different possible fuels, I think is really going, in the end, to be the answer. Now, there's a couple of very important points. Uh, one, it's not maintenance free. We've talked about this a bunch. You do have to get the car maintained. So don't think that you're just gonna buy this thing and never touch it again. You pretty much have to have a garage. So if you live in an apartment complex and you live in a city center, it's going to be a while before it's really feasible and viable to have an electric car. If you've got a garage and you've got the ability to put an electric to, uh, electricity to your garage, then awesome, you are set. But having to charge this thing out and about is really going to be probably more of a pain than it's worth. Now, specifically about this Tesla, I think if you put all the kind of features and all the tech together, it sort of points in a singular direction. And that is to remove the driver from the driving experience. Well, you've got autopilot. That's an obvious thing, right? But you've got no gauges and things in front of you. You've got so much automation in the systems behind it. And then you've got kind of all these sort of silly things like you can watch Netflix. Of course, you can't do that while you're driving, but uh, there's little entertainment things. Everything seems to be pulling you away from the actual driving experience. But it's important to note that the autopilot system on this car is not perfect yet and it hasn't been perfected still requires you to stay in control and watching what you're doing and most importantly these cars are not going to take responsibility if they get into an accident so if the car is driving along and it crashes into something on autopilot that's still your responsibility there's a guy uh recently that was checking on his dog in the back seat and ended up rear-ending a cop car on this off the side of the road a little bit wow so he got the tickets for that because Tesla is not going to take that responsibility. You are still in control and in charge, at least, of the car. So you need to be focused on what's going on, which is kind of weird because it seems like the car is kind of pulling, these features are kind of pulling you away from that, actually. So I think the end result, uh, certainly Elon's view, I think, of things is that these cars will all be auto driving, that the driver won't have to fuss with it, can do other things while they're driving to work. Finally alleviating the one last thing about your commute that's such a nightmare, and that is the actual driving bit, right? So I don't know, that's kind of interesting. I think that's still quite a ways down the road before it's really, really solid and not scary and can, and can do this in bad weather. That's one of the problems, right? If people get used to not driving and they get used to not paying attention on the road, what happens if all of a sudden they hit a bad snowstorm or a really crazy rainstorm where you can't see anything and the car's like all right that's it and throws up its hands like I, I, i'm done my cameras are all jacked up and i can't see so um you know good luck so that's going to be a thing for people i think but as these systems get better and as they progress i think they'll be able to take on more difficult more difficult situations and nah, maybe at the end they'll alleviate it. But I think it's kind of interesting that they're moving the driver away. They're quiet. They're calming inside. There's no real interaction. Now, in order to sell a car like that, 
Elon Musk has added some solid clickbait to this thing. That zero to 60 time, total clickbait, right? I mean, that's really fun. That, that sort of sits outside of that, doesn't it? That's a driving experiencing thing, isn't it? But I think that's really just to get you into the cars and get some good publicity for the cars. And he really would like to beat an ICE in every possible aspect. So performance is a big deal. But some of the other parlor tricks in this car are kind of dumb, like farting seats and, and in my opinion, some of this other stuff, being able to watch movies and stuff in the car, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's a car, right? But maybe that attitude of it's a car, it should be treated like a car. Maybe that's different now. Maybe it's just a transportation module and we don't even think about it as a car anymore. I don't know. It's very different. It brings up a lot of different emotions, a lot of different issues and things with the car. And the, it really is a paradigm shift in how we transport ourselves from one place to another. Now, there's a lot of people who are not going to make that change. They just don't like the electric car and there is some hate for them, which I find that absolutely crazy. That's just dumb. In the end, these are basically cars, so let's not get all crazy about that. Yeah, they don't have an engine, but they're not going to be pushing ICE cars off the road. These electric cars are really just in response to what's going on with pollution and what's going on with world politics and stuff. It's not the other way around. No need to get upset with the electric car. Will ICE cars go away? Yeah, at some point you won't be able to buy them anymore. I mean, that's going to be many, many years in the future though, so I won't worry about that just yet. Will we be banned from driving IC cars? Well, probably in some areas, but you know, they still allow horses, so I don't think it's going to be a thing. If you've got your classic car or your special car that you really like, it's going to be a really long time before that gets kicked off the road, if ever. I just think, you know, there's no need to get crazy about these cars. Well, I hope you enjoyed this rather long video about my opinions and kind of thoughts about this car and electric cars in general. I tried to roll in a few things from my experience with our i8 as well. If you did, please give the video a thumbs up. Questions or comments, go ahead and leave them down below. I'm sure there'll be a lot. It's a it's a very controversial subject. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, we do mostly sort of classic car and ICE stuff, but we do, of course, have the i8, so we do content with that as well. And if you find this interesting, please subscribe, hit the little bell next to it to get notified. Thank you so, so much for watching. And as always, a special thank you to our Patreon supporters. Until next time, safe travels. Bye.